Welcome to this online lesson asking who were the Tudors? Our aim is to know how the Tudor era started. Here's a little thing to get you started though. Have you seen these roses before? What might they represent? If you're not sure, just take a guess. In a moment we'll be moving on to some pre-test questions, so you could always skip this bit if you like, but if you do reckon you analyze these roses, then make a note now. Pause the video if you want to do that, or just carry on. Let's have a look at some pre-test questions. You might be familiar with some of these, or you might be completely unfamiliar with them. However, there will be answers at the end of the video, so do your best effort for the time being, and then you can correct them if you need to at the end. Question number one. Who did Henry VII defeat at Bosworth Field in 1485? Write down your answer now. Okay, if I'm going too fast, you can always pause the video at the end and go back through them. Question number two. What religious movement did Martin Luther start? Not to be confused with Martin Luther King, who's from a much more recent time period. Question number three. What was the act of supremacy? Question number four. Give two reasons why Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries. Question number five. Give the names of Henry VIII's wives in order of marriage. Question number six. What was the fate of Henry VIII's third wife? And question number seven. Name all three of Henry VIII's children. Okay, if you want to have a little bit more time on that, pause the video now and complete those questions. As I say, we'll go through the answers at the end. Firstly, by way of an introduction, let's consider an important event in English history, the Wars of the Roses. To this day, there is a big rivalry between two English counties. Each uses a rose as its symbol. Which counties are these? And which rose do they use? Well, I'm a massive cricket fan, so I know this answer really, really well. In fact, the matches between these two counties are often called the Roses matches. Well, there we've got the Red Rose of Lancashire, and we've got the White Rose of Yorkshire. But where does this fit into history? Well, the Wars of the Roses were a series of very devastating civil wars in England between the House of York and the House of Lancaster over who should be king. At various times, each side was winning, but ultimately in 1485, the issue would be decided for good. This painting shows one of the decisive moments. It should be said, though, that this is quite an inaccurate painting in many respects. But where are the roses? Well, if you look very closely... White roses are shown on the banner of the King of England, Richard III, here, with his famous white boar, his personal symbol. And on the other side, you might just be able to make out the red roses on the standard of Henry Tudor, later to become Henry VII of England. Notice in the foreground, too, the Welsh flag. Yes, Henry Tudor had Welsh connections, although he spent much of his childhood in hiding. Note down this as a subheading, the Wars of the Roses. Between 1455 and 1485, a civil war raged between the Plantagenet family, otherwise known as the House of York, and the Tudor family, otherwise known as the House of Lancaster, over who should be king. What is a civil war, first of all? Well, hopefully you realise that a civil war is any war that takes part in one country between two sides or more sides within that same country. So, for example, the English Civil War in the 1640s was between the Royalists and the Parliamentarians. The Wars of the Roses were a civil war between the Houses of York and Lancaster. A civil war is where people from the same country fight each other. For most of this war, the Plantagenets were winning, until finally Richard III was killed at the Battle of Bosworth. There's a picture of Richard III. 
The winning side was Henry Tudor. He became Henry VII, the first Tudor king of England. And there is Henry VII. Notice that he is wearing, uh, holding a red rose of Lancaster. Some tasks then. Firstly, Henry VII became killed by killing the old king Richard III in battle. What problems might this cause him in controlling England? Secondly, as an extension, could this actually have strengthened Henry's position? Pause the video while you answer those questions. They'll probably take you about five minutes. I'd also encourage you to take some notes on the Wars of the Roses if this topic is new to you. That might take you a further five minutes and you can use the information on the screen. Pause the video now. Well, firstly, Henry's position may have caused him problems because by killing the old king, well, Richard III's supporters are going to be very angry and they're going to be out for revenge. However, this could have actually strengthened Henry's positions in some way. It wasn't like Richard III was going to come back at all. And also, Richard III's followers followed him as their king. Now he's dead, who should they follow? Do they rise up and try and install another Yorkist king? Or do they accept defeat? and decide to follow Henry VII for a quiet and possibly more prosperous life. Well, this was the dilemma facing the people of England at this time. Firstly, a bit of a note on Richard III. We're not going to be spending long looking at him, but he's really got a very different reputation to what he was probably really like. A very famous Shakespearean play, Richard III, portrays Richard as a almost mutated villain, with a hunchback, and villainous ways. However, the truth is probably quite different. Recently, Richard's skeleton was found in a car park in Leicester. He'd originally been hastily buried inside a monastery. The monastery was taken down by Henry VIII, more of that in a future lesson, and his grave was left behind. Modern forensic scientists produced this likeness of Richard III, so his painting wasn't really far off. Here's something interesting, though. One thing that Shakespeare said about Richard III was true. He may not have been truly hunchbacked, but notice his spine in the picture on the left. That curvature shows that he would have had a quite significant back abnormality. And so perhaps one part of Richard III's famous reputation is true. But let's move on to Henry VII and what he was like. We're going to attempt to interview Henry VII now. Obviously, you can't do that, do that through the video, so I'm going to have to have him here with me through my time machine, and we can ask him questions there. Luckily, the time machine is working well enough that he'll be able to answer honestly as, as he would have done in 1485. Unfortunately, one of the effects of my faulty time machine is that he'll sound quite a lot like me and have a really unconvincing Welsh accent. Oh well, you can't please everyone. There's Henry. Henry became king in 1485, but he had many enemies. How could he secure his kin kingdom? Can he change the minds of his en former enemies? Your task is to make notes on the following. How Henry intended to stop Richard's supporters from overthrowing him. Secondly, getting people to be loyal to him. And thirdly, getting enough money to rule the kingdom. Some words that Henry may mention are in this glossary here. Yorkists, Order of the Garter, Pretender, Attainder, bonds and recognizances. If you, he mentions these words and doesn't explain them fully, then refer to the glossary and include them in your notes and in your answer. In fact, you might want to pause the video now and note down the key vocabulary first. It's up to you. Pause the video if you wish to do this, or just keep going if you want to get straight to the interview. So it's time to ask Henry some, uh, some questions. Henry, welcome to the studio. I do hope that your trip across time was not too difficult. Well, thank you very much. Uh, actually, it wasn't too bad, but as you can hear, my voice is slightly strange. It's supposed to be a Welsh accent, but it's not terribly convincing, is it? Well, no, not really, Henry. But uh, never mind that. Let's ask you some questions. Clearly, you've got some big challenges becoming king in 1485. How are you going to stop Richard's supporters from overthrowing you? Well, that's probably the most difficult problem I've got to deal with early in my career. The thing is, I'm going to be challenged at every turn by the Yorkists who wish that Richard III hadn't been killed. So I'm going to have to do two things here. 
for some of them, it's going to be a case of trying to convince them that I'm the rightful king and that actually they could do quite well of just following me. On the other hand, if they don't want to do that, I can just punish them and hopefully that way they'll step into line or perhaps they'll simply be dead. So, first of all, the Yorkists have to pledge their allegiance to me if they want to have good treatment. If they do that, then I will certainly consider forgiving them for their former sins and maybe rewarding them. If they refuse to, then I still have my armies in the field and I can go and beat them in battle if necessary. Or, as I am now king, I can simply seize their land. So, first things first, either they submit to me or they suffer the consequences. Well, thank you, Henry. I'm sure that you'll be uh, more detailed about the sort of punishments that you will give them later on. Uh, yes, I can tell you more about that if you like. Um, for example, I'm intending to use attainders against these people. Uh, an attainder is a way of punishing these nobles by restricting their power and wealth. I can seize their land off them, which is where they get most of their money and most of their wealth, uh, and I can say that I will, can give it back to them as long as they behave, or I can seize it for good. It's really up to me. Another way that I can punish them is through a system of bonds and recognizances. Uh, those people who I perhaps do not trust, but haven't got sufficient reason to kick out of their positions entirely, can be made to pay a fine called a bond to me, the king. This is a bit like a tax, but it's more of a punishment, really. On the other hand, I can use something called the recognizances. This is a little bit more complicated, but I'll explain it briefly. Basically, with the recognizances, I don't necessarily force them to pay, but I make it very clear to them that they might be forced to pay if they misbehave. This is one way of making sure that the Yorkists don't rebel against me, and indeed any other nobles in England who hadn't been clear which side they were on might be more likely to serve with me if they've got the threat of having to pay a hefty fine. It'll make me rich, but it will make them very miserable. Okay, thanks, Henry. That makes uh, some sense, I suppose. Possibly not a way of making you particularly popular. I'm not interested in being popular. I'm interested in ruling the country. Uh, understood. Apologies. Uh, don't put an attainder on me. So how are you planning on getting people to be loyal to you? Well, as I've already said, I can use a system of attainders, bonds and recognizances to ensure loyalty. Uh, but that's very much what you might call the stick approach, where I punish them in order to keep them in line. On the other hand, I've got a system of rewards as well. The trouble is, I do not have a lot of money to begin with. So I've got to have a system of rewards that does not involve having a lot of money. One thing I can do is I can take the land of people who have been killed in the war, especially those people who are on the wrong side, and I can grant it to my loyal followers. This is a little bit like uh, William the Conqueror did right back in 1066 when he rewarded the people who fought with him at Hastings. On the other hand, I can perhaps offer them a reward which doesn't cost me any money, but they will still really value. For example, some of my most loyal knights can be offered the Order of the Garter. Now, this is the highest rank of knightship in England. It doesn't actually cost me very much money at all, but it helps make them very loyal. Only a very few knights in England at any one time can be part of the Order of the Garter, and so it is held in very high regard. The people who I make knights of the Order of the Garter are likely to stay very loyal to me indeed. Well, that seems to make sense as well, Henry. You mentioned you're a bit strapped for cash, so how are you going to get enough money to rule your kingdom? Well, first of all, we have the fines, the bonds and the recognizances which I'm going to charge to my former enemies. However, England does have a sophisticated network of taxation. I've got a particular friend, Henry Morton, who's a very skilled economist. That means that he understands money very well. I'm going to use him to make sure that he can squeeze as much tax out of the people as possible. Of course, this might not make me particularly popular, but what I can do is I can make sure that people are too scared not to pay up. And this is again where my attainders, bonds and recognizances come in. Of course, for lower down people, the threat of fines is usually bad enough. The threat of execution is certainly enough to make them cough up most of the time. Well, thanks, Henry. I hope that your voice gets better soon and that your trip back to 1485 isn't going to be too bumpy. Um, also... Um, do you have any sons to carry on your name? Well, I certainly hope to one day, uh, hopefully at least two, so that if one of them dies, then I've still got a spare, haven't I? Uh, it's what you might call an heir and a spare. But uh, I suppose if I'm going to do that, I'm going to need to get married. I do have a plan, though. And if my marriage plans come to fruition, it means that it will stop 
Richard's supporters rising up against me, at least some of them. It will help get people to be loyal towards me. And who knows, it might even raise a little bit of money for me as well. Well, thanks, Henry. We'll find out more about that in a moment. Uh, see you around. I very much doubt that. Anyway, Hulvar. Well, that was strange, wasn't it? Anyway, what we have established is that Henry is now king. And he mentioned a marriage. That's what we're going to have a look at now. Firstly, a question for you. Jot down some reasons why it might be a good idea to marry someone. What do people these days look for in a partner? Pause the video as you jot down three or four suggestions. Well, in medieval times, kings usually get married for these reasons, and they might not be the same as the ones that you noted down. They marry for more power. If they can marry into a more powerful family, or perhaps a more powerful kingdom, then that can increase their standing. They marry for more land. They marry for more wealth. They marry for, to make friends with other families or other countries and form alliances. They marry so that they can have children, so that there is another character king to follow on afterwards. Actually, loving your wife was less important to medieval kings. That might seem like a shame, but that's kind of the nature of politics at this time. And it also arguably shows how little power women really had. So how could Henry solve the fighting in his newly won kingdom? Well, your task then. Firstly, list the reasons kings got married in order of importance based upon your opinion. You can see the bullet points above there. Secondly, explain your choices for the most and least important. Why have you chosen them? Thirdly, as an extension, does this mean that medieval kings and queens never actually loved each other? Explain your point of view. Pause the video while you answer those questions. All right, so hopefully you've put those in order and you've chosen your most and least important and explained your choices. But does that mean that medieval kings and queens never loved each other? Well, certainly sometimes it did, but not always. However, often these matches, if they turned into something of a love affair, that was more luck than judgment. As it turned out, Henry VII married Elizabeth of York. The reasons for that might be obvious already. Luckily for them, their union was a happy one, and they actually seemed to be quite happy as husband and wife. But the main reason why they got married was not about that at all. It was about securing Henry's position on the throne. So are there any clues as to how Henry brought peace to England in these pictures? Look carefully. Did you spot the roses? Well, here we can see that Henry Tudor is holding the red rose of Lancaster and Elizabeth of York is holding the white rose of Yorkshire. That's right, Elizabeth of York was a Yorkist. By marrying her, Henry would unite the houses of Tudor and the house of York into one new royal family. Hopefully, therefore, uniting the old Yorkists who might otherwise rise up against him and Henry's own supporters and bringing peace to the kingdom. This was a truly political and hopefully very successful marriage. So, your question. How did Henry try to bring peace to England through marriage? Consider what we've just discussed and through what you heard in the interview and write down your answer to that question now. Pause the video while you do so. So hopefully you've recognised that by uniting these two families that had been at war, it would hopefully, hopefully bring peace to the kingdom, because ultimately the family would only be fighting itself. The Tudor Rose is perhaps the most famous reminder of this, is a symbol that endures to this day. Again, we've got the Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York, and when combined, they make the Tudor Rose. Notice that the Tudor rose is usually, although not always, shown with the red rose on the outside, bigger. Perhaps this is symbolic of it being more important and how Henry Tudor's family, the House of Lancaster, absorbed the, the uh, House of York. Your tasks then. Firstly, which rose represented Henry VII's family and which represented Elizabeth's family? And secondly, explain how the Tudor rose represented peace in England. Thirdly, as something of a challenge, where might you have seen this symbol today? It is still quite common, but give it some thought. Pause the video while you answer those questions. All 
All right. So hopefully we've recognised that the House of Lancaster belongs to Henry VII, the House of York. The White Rose belongs to Elizabeth of York. And this represents peace in England because it shows the union of the two families in a very visual way. Well, you may have seen the Tudor Rose used into, as part of tourist signs. Visit England used the Tudor Rose as their main symbol. And you can see that on some road signs too, including this one showing the route to Clovelly in North Devon. We're now going to produce some royal wedding invitations, which will help explain the importance of this royal wedding. Henry VII and Elizabeth of York were married on January the 18th of 1486, so save the date. Note that down now. Here's how we're going to produce our wedding invitations. Henry of Lancaster, Henry VII, still had lots of enemies after killing Richard III of York and becoming king. The most important nobles in the country were invited to witness his wedding to Elizabeth of York. Remember, this wasn't a marriage of love, at least not to begin with, but it was about bringing peace to the kingdom. What you'll need to include on your wedding invitation is a layout much like the one on the right, but with space for more writing, so that you can explain the meanings behind these symbols and the meanings behind the wedding. So explain what happened to make Henry king. Describe what happened in the Wars of the Roses, and how did William, not William, sorry, how did Henry eventually win? Henry became king. An example of why he became king is this made him king because. You could use this writing frame if you need to, but hopefully you can add a little bit more detail than that. Explain why he married Elizabeth of York. Consider the problems that he was facing at the start of his reign. Again, you can use this writing frame if you need to, but preferably you can make it more detailed than that. When you've got these two sections completed, move on. Explain the importance of the roses and the Tudor rose, and indeed the marriage overall. If you have time, you could add some pictures to illustrate. You can use the notes from the remainder of this lesson or replay parts of this video, including the interview with Henry VII, if you need to get more information or if your notes earlier were not adequate. Other than that, pause the video now and produce a detailed poster wedding invitation explaining what happened to make Henry King, why he married Elizabeth of York, and the importance of the symbols of the roses. And again, you may include pictures to illustrate if you have time, but please don't prioritise that and only do that last. Pause the video while you complete your poster. You might remember at the start of the lesson, we had some pre-tests. Well, we're going to have a look at the answers now. Correct your answers if you got any wrong. And of course, some of these might, you might have been completely unfamiliar with. So if you end up with zero, it's not the end of the world. However, if you encounter this test again and you get zero again, you will need to look over it and try and memorise things a bit better. So who did Henry VII defeat at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485? Hopefully we know that from today's lesson. It was Richard III. What religious movement did Martin Luther start? Well, we've not yet looked at that, but he started the Protestant Church, or Protestantism. What was the act of supremacy? Well, this is something relating to Henry VII's son, Henry VIII. This was a law that made Henry VIII the head of the church. Give two reasons that Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries. There are loads that you could go for here, and they might not be on this list, but here are some basic ones. To get money or land, to give land to his supporters, to increase his power over the church, to get rid of opponents, and to make England more Protestant. If you've got ones that are along those lines, you can give yourself the mark. Have you made your corrections? If so, we'll move on to the last few questions. Question number five. Give the names of Henry VIII's wives in order of marriage. Well, here they are. Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon, interestingly, was originally married to Henry's brother, Arthur. That caused a certain amount of controversy later on. Anne Boleyn. Jane Seymour. Anne of Cleves. Catherine Howard. And Catherine Parr. There's a famous rhyme to remember what happened to each of these, rhymes, uh, these wives. Divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. So what was the fate of Henry VIII's third wife? She died after childbirth. Name all three of Henry VIII's children. Well, Jane Seymour died after giving birth to Edward. But that was actually the third of Henry's three children. The first was Mary, the second Elizabeth, and the third Edward. 
Catherine of Aragon gave birth to Mary, Anne Boleyn gave birth to Elizabeth, and Jane Seymour gave birth to Edward. That meant that Mary was a Catholic, Elizabeth was Protestant, and so was Edward. All three of them would eventually rule England at some point in their lives. And once you've made your corrections, that's the conclusion of this lesson. I'll say thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been useful. And if it has, do feel free to like and subscribe to this video. But that's all for now. Thank you very much and goodbye.